On the Wado Radio Show. Of course, man, it's DJ Wado. It's the Wado Radio Show. It's more than music. It's ministry, man, and we have a uh, we have a guest on. He's been with us a couple of times, man. And uh, I always say this brother is one of the most in tune pastors uh, with the Christian rap community. Uh, and he just put out a new book. Uh, the book is called Reviving the Black Church. Uh, but more than that, he's the pastor at Anacostia River Church in Washington, D.C. Uh, previously, I think the last time he was on, he was he was still at First Baptist Church in the Grand Cayman Islands. And of course, uh, you can read his blogs at the front porch. And uh, he's a council member with the Gospel Coalitions. But Tabidi Anyabile is with us on the line. Pastor Tabidi, how you doing today, bro? Hey, brother, I'm doing good by God's grace, man. It's a, it's a joy to be with you again, man. Always, man. Um, and how how has the church plant been coming? Um, I know we, we talked about it a bit at Legacy, but, uh, you know, mm. just being in its infancy stages still, I know it's, uh, uh, you know, you, you're building down there, man. Yeah, man, you know, the Lord's been so gracious to us, brother. We're, we're six months in in terms of public meetings. We launched on Easter, uh, Easter this year. And, uh, man, we just, we're just so encouraged, man. I, the Lord has sent us older people and younger people. Mm. He sent us people who are zealous for the gospel and zealous evangelistically. That's one of the things that encourages me most, man. Every, almost every weekend, I have a brother named Jahil Richards on our staff who, uh, leads sometimes upwards of 20 people, uh, door to door and on the block sharing the gospel, man, wow. trying to meet people where they are. Yeah, that's been massively encouraging. And so as a consequence, so that, you know, we, we see people, you know, coming to visit us who, have, if they've ever been a part of the church world, they long since checked out. Mm. And um, and so we're just, we're just grateful for what the Lord is doing in that and stirring us with this kind of um, hunger to, to really take the gospel out to the block and uh, am encouraged by just the church family itself. I mean, it's we have visitors say to us, you know, we, we we know you guys are a new church, but it doesn't feel that way. It feels like <laughs> you guys are established and warm and wow. loving. So the Lord's been kind to give us early on uh, a, a warm family feel. And so we just, we're rejoicing in His grace. You know, He gets all the credit because we don't know what we're doing. Um, we're just trying to trying to be faithful um, in our in our context, man, and we, we're really encouraged. Man, that's good. That's that is uh that's encouraging to hear, man. And um, I know how much of a heart you you have for that area for DC in particular. Um, and then obviously, um, through this new book you have and some of your previous work, um, particularly on the front porch and some of the other books you've published, you have a real passion for the black church. Um, mm. and this this title uh gripped me when I saw it, reviving the black church. Um, I think it would probably be good just for the purposes of this of our audience here is just to talk about uh, even why you feel there's a need to revive the black church, uh, because you know how our people get, man. Sometimes we get defensive, um, yeah. you know, but but but, uh, you know, I, I think you got a good vantage point and, and you know, we'd just love for you to share that with people. Man, yeah, I appreciate that, brother. Um you know, it, it's interesting, man. Um, Eddie Glaude, Princeton professor, wrote a couple years back on the Huffington Post, a post that didn't ask the question but made the statement, the black church is dead. Mm. And you can, you can imagine what that touched off, man. And um, over the last few years, you know, I, I've been bumping into that question in various forms in various places. So Eddie Glaude writes his post about a year or so later. Uh, Anthony Bradley had a conference down in Mississippi sort of on that question. Um, and just in private conversations, it's, it's a, it's a conversation that we have. Um, now, Teddy Glaude's position is because the church in his view is ineffective politically, mm. then it's dead. Yep. You know, he's measuring it by yep. the church's sort of public prophetic, you know, ability. Now, I come along as someone who believes the Bible to be the Word of God, as, as most African American Christians do, someone who believes that the Word is life. And I say, well, listen, I don't think the church is dead, but let's assume that it was. These bones can live again, and, and it, it, the, the church lives by the preaching of the Word. You think about Ezekiel, when, when God tells the prophet Ezekiel to prophesy to the valley of, of, of dry bones, dead bones, and, and Ezekiel prophesies. 
and those bones start to give flesh and tissue, and a nation arises from those bones. Well, yeah. it's a picture of how God's Word gives life to His people. And so the heart of the book really is to say, you know what, uh, whatever you think the state of the Church is, its real power, its real life, comes from having the Word of God really, truly at the center of everything and driving everything, because because our life comes from His Word. And so I try to work out in a book uh, a kind of vision for how that, how that happens and try to work out in a book sort of a, a conversation between what I think is sort of three broad camps that um, kind of think about this question differently. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll tell you something that's interesting, man, is um, I saw this come back up when everything happened uh, at um, at um, the church in Charleston uh, when, mm-hmm. when, when, when the young man came in there and, you know, he killed nine persons. Um, and obviously in the media, uh, this was discussed as being an African-American church, of which it was, you know, AME church. Mm-hmm. And so I saw many of... Uh, not even just our white brothers and sisters, but people of just different races saying, why do we have black churches even to begin with? You know yeah. what I mean? And um, obviously, I mean, you 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 are a wealth of information when it comes to um, just the history of the black church, theology, those types of things. And um, man, I would just love to to kind of hear you, uh, you know, expound on you know, just that, mm-hmm. that whole piece of why these black churches uh, even exist, even to this day? Yeah, that's a great question. And and my answer to that is, to, to be really sort of short and to the point, is that black churches exist because of white racism. Mm. When, you, when you look at the founding of African-American Christianity, it kind of has two parents. Yep. On the one hand, there's this uh, experience in predominantly white or, or white-controlled churches um, wherein slaves were permitted to, to worship and to be a part, or in camp meetings, um, you know, slaves were often there. The camp meetings generally had a more egalitarian kind of impulse. There's that, a sort of evangelical parent. But then there's also what's called the hush arbors, the ways in which slaves would steal away into the woods at night to have their own services. And, and those two experiences are... Uh, the sort of mother and father, if you will, of, of today's black church. Uh, from one, African American churches get their kind of evangelical theology. Mm-hmm. And from the other, African American churches get their, call it evangelical ethics. Um, and so what's really, what's really startling to people about, say, Charleston, South Carolina, is just what a powerful witness of forgiveness was on display there. Well, now, if you're familiar with the black church, that doesn't surprise you. Yep. Because the African American church has had to forgive a whole lot of stuff for now 300 years. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, the, the, the ethics of the African American church um, are, in my opinion, unimpeachable. And as one theologian put it, you know, demonstrates that, that black Christianity is the truest form of Christianity in the United States. Uh, because because African American Christians have had to live under the hard side of life, had to live out the faith despite so many kinds of things like Charleston shooting or slavery or too mm-hmm. pro. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those are his two parents. But, you know, the, the sort of the breaking away into a, a separate church, which we call the Black Church, sure. that really happens uh, in the 1800s when, when white churches begin to move in a, in a very segregationist direction. So most, most people would date it back to Absalom Jones and Richard Allen there in Philadelphia, yep. where they were part of a, a, a mixed congregation where they had helped to build a new, a new church building. Um, and then the church leaders, the white church leaders, segregated the church, forcibly removed Absalom Jones from up front where he was praying. And those African-American Christians walked out, and you get the birth of Mother Bethel and the AME, and the AME Church and yep. so on. Yep. So it has been white racism that has created the black church in part. Wow. The continuance of the African American church is therefore critical uh, until there's real repentance and reconciliation at a deep level that repairs some of those breaches and stops asking the foolish question, why is there a black church? 
that's an ignorant question. You don't know your history. Yeah. Um, it, you know, until there's at least enough honesty and awareness to, to say there's an African-American church because because we created it in our sin against our brethren, well, then we, we can always have an African-American church, and we, we won't see the kind of multi-ethnic church that many people, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, would long to see. That, that's just deep heart work that has to happen there. Yeah, we, we we were um I was on a periscope with BJ Thompson the other day. It was mm-hmm. I was in his scope, uh so he was scoping and I was commenting and one of the one of the things that he uh was talking about in the scope was this uh this movement, I guess that's kind of existed in the last fifty years or so to really get back to uh having multi ethnic congregations. Um mm-hmm. but one of the points that he made, and I would just love love to hear your take on this he said, "Yo, we can we can have different races there, but are we going to uh, respect one another's cultures and even celebrate one another's cultures within that multi ethnic context?" Um, and I thought that was a really interesting take because so often uh, when you're a minority in culture, um, even when when people say you know multiracial, multi ethnic, the assumption is that you will just assimilate to majority culture as opposed to mm-hmm. having your own culture you know celebrated and you know um uh put on display like some of the others and so i would just love to hear your take because i know you move in a lot of different different circles there yeah no i think i think bj is spot on so um part of what is difficult about living out the christian life with all god's people redeemed people across ethnic lines and cultural lines and class lines, is that we, we find it really easy uh, to sort of lean back on our own experience and culture, as we would never say this, but we, we find it easy to lean on it as the right one, right? And um, the, the, the majority cultures in a, in a particular church, you know, they don't, they don't question their cultural orientation. Mm. They, they assume it to be normative, and they assume yeah. that what it means for you to be a part of, quote, their church, not our church, but their church, is that you sort of begin to move and act and, and think in ways that uh, are consistent with their cultural orientation. It's, it's another one of those places where privilege, you know, exerts itself. And so unless there is a, a dying to self, as the Lord calls us to, you know, in many places in the Scripture, and unless we are uh, really intentional about having the Scripture give us a culture, mm. having the Scripture affirm good things about our ethnic identities, but yeah. also challenge some things that, yeah. that need to be challenged so that we are being conformed to Christ, then we're always going to feel like reconciliation and and really owning the same church together. We're always going to feel like that's off in the distance because we're we're going to be uh, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally um, promoting one cultural thing over another, or even taking something that all cultures share and saying, "Well, it it it, it, it kind of is uniquely this culture, mm, or it's this way because of this culture," yeah. and. Um, you know, I, I get disturbed sometimes when I see people writing about the superiority of one culture or another. That, that, that's really just racism in more palatable language, that's because good. they're assigning to particular people groups, you know, a kind of superiority about this or that, uh, when that's just really, that's just really not the case. And, and what I'm thinking about there is when... Um, uh, you may remember this a year or so ago, several white pastors at a conference had some hard things to say about Christian hip hop. Um, oh yeah. And, I remember um, that, that panel. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. And, and the conversation that flowed out of that wave, man, it was interesting for me to watch, you know, shy did a yeoman's job in that man. Cause yeah. he, he was very patient, very yeah. biblical as he always is yeah. trying to sort of, you know, push in the right direction on some things. But to watch guys responding by saying, well, there are some things that are in, in cultures that are superior in one culture over and against another. Yep. And I just thought to myself, you don't hear yourself. Because yep. that, that's, yep. just, that's just a hair's breadth away from saying, you know, there's some races that are superior. Right. Um, and, um, you know, and so until we sort of say, no, we all need to die to self 
and we need to recognize that we have idols in our cultural um, sort of leanings. And until we smash those idols and say, let us be formed by the Word of God, and let's let the Word both affirm good things in our culture and identities, but also challenge things that need to be challenged, then we won't be growing, as Ephesians 2 says, into one new man in Christ. We'll, we'll be we'll be finding ways to pull against each other in order to serve our idols. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the book, man, you, you have... Uh, I guess what I would call three areas um, through which we can be revived, the black church, um, the word, godly leadership, um, and then membership and mission um, together. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, I mean, there's so much that stuck out to me in this book, but one of the things when you were going through, uh, you had a couple chapters back to back on preaching um, Mm -hmm. and, and you talked about some of the issues that exist today with preaching, you know, style over substance, you know, um, uh, I, I think you used the term, uh, what'd you say? A lot of gravy, not that much meat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and, and so I, I think for me, man, just as someone who has, has grown up, uh, in the black church, still attend a black church and leadership at a black church. And I see these things. I mean, you pointed out things and I'm like, yep. Um, you know, we see this all across the board. I think, um, helping people even understand the perspective of how we even got into those positions, uh, how those things mm-hmm. almost became synonymous and accepted um, when there were some times where there was a lot more sound theology uh, in our black churches, I think would, would probably even help some of the people listening right now um, to kind of understand, hey, this is how we got here. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting, man. Um I've loved for the years of having these kinds of conversations and um, sometimes not speaking as carefully as I need to or sometimes uh, people going away with something completely different than what I meant. I've learned over the years to say, you know, a couple of things. Uh, One is that there's nothing that the African-American church needs that white, Asian, Hispanic churches don't also need. Oh, that's good. Right. So, yep. so the word of God, you know, so when it, this book is titled Reviving the Black Church because I have a particular concern and love for, for my own community and the well-being of the church in our community. But I, I hope that anybody can pick this up and go, no, I see how this applies to rural Arkansas, you know, in, in much the same way. Yeah. That's the first thing. There's nothing that the African American church needs that all churches don't need. The second thing is to say, um, you know, we talk about the black church, and uh, and particularly when we talk about the critiques of the black church, how well she's doing or not, many people, their minds go pretty quickly to the people sitting in the pew. So they, so they think you're, you're sort of attacking people sometimes. Sure. Uh, what I want to say, when it comes to, say, some of the weaknesses in preaching, you know, the question you just asked me about and so on and so forth, I'm actually aiming at the pastor. Yeah. I'm actually aiming I'm yeah. actually aiming at the leader. The yeah. problem isn't the people. Yeah. Oftentimes the problem is the pulpit. It's yeah. it's the leaders in the pulpit and whether or not they are faithful, because that will determine the people's faithfulness, right? Um and so when I think about, for example, style over substance or think about, you know, particular cultural forms of preaching. And preaching in the African American tradition has always been diverse. You know, there there's the, the stereotype about the hooper and emotionalism and, and, and but there have always been expositors and as you said a moment ago, there have been very doctrinal preachers yeah. preachers in our tradition and expositional preachers. That's not new to us. And and it's not it's not sort of um, new for some conference that, that sort of focused on those things. Those things are old, which is why I like to quote a, a lot of the history and the historical figures. But here's the thing. When it comes to, to preaching and evaluating preaching, you know who are the cats who, who hang most tightly, for example, to hooping as an example? It's not the people in the pew. Mm. It's the preacher. That's <laughs> just the, the strongest defenders mm. of hooping are hooping preachers. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, that's exactly right. And 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 the people. I, I mean, I've been in. I don't know how many churches, preached in how many churches. I, I don't know how many churches. And and I'm not a hooper. And I, I'm not saying hooping's wrong in and of itself. 
but there needs to be some meat with the gravy to go back to your your image. Yeah. Uh, I can't tell you how many churches I've been in where, you know, I preach and people come to me and say, thank you for opening the Word of God. Thank you for explaining <laughs> this text. And, 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 you, and you know the next thing they say? You know the next thing I say? If I had a dollar for every time I heard this, the people in the pew say, I don't need all that hooping. Mm. I don't need all that show. I don't need all that fill in the blank. Now, that's what you hear from many people in the pew. Yeah. But the conversation with the preacher is different because the preacher, we, we are invested in um, the art of preaching. We are invested in people's opinions about our preaching. Wow. Um, and so much of our identity is tied up with style in preaching. And so, you know, I say all that to say, when, when I'm talking in those first couple of chapters about preaching, I'm not talking about the pew, I'm talking about the pulpit. Yeah, the pulpit. And, and I think that oftentimes where, where there's weak preaching in a church, the problem's not the pew, it's the preacher doing the weak preaching. Yeah. Uh, and, and we need to do the gut check, and we need to do the self-examination. And the health of our churches, the people in our churches, depend upon whether or not we are humble before God. Uh, to learn and to grow, and maybe uh, learn and grow in new ways, putting down some old treasured ways that are um, that are that are making us ineffective. I mean, Jesus puts it this way, talking to the scribes and Pharisees. He says, "Your traditions that made the word of God of no effect." And it would be interesting to sit down and have a conversation about what traditions in our setting, in our culture, in our churches are actually making the Word of God ineffective. Mm. And, and, and I, would, I would wager to say we could probably identify some preaching traditions, some leadership traditions. We could identify any number of kind of cultural traditions, and not, not sort of formal African-American culture, but the culture of our local churches, the things we do, because we've always done them. Sure. You know, we, we could identify all kinds of things that are actually squeezing out the Word of God and therefore making the Word of no effect, making it of no power. Uh, and so the book is about, no, let's put the Word of God back in the center, and let's give our attention to it so that we might live in the power that God puts in His Word. That's good. Um, I, I want to jump in a little bit, but um, chapter 9 uh, challenged me tremendously, um, and that's the chapter where you're talking about rethinking pastor training. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, you basically stated that, um, the, the church needs to have a more active role in training pastors. Um, mm -hmm. and it almost seems as, as though you're saying not necessarily to do away with seminaries, but mm -hmm. that they like that training should start in churches and almost as if seminaries should be a supplement and man, I can just tell you, I've met so many pastors, and they're like, "Man, you you can't preach in this pulpit unless you've gone to seminary." But then they offer no training in the church yeah. to, to kind of help develop leaders. And yeah. I never, I'll be honest with you, I never, um, I, I you know, I know, uh, you know, Mark Dever uh, does a lot of that. Uh, at his church, but I guess I never really thought about it from this perspective until I read that chapter. And I was just, I was kind of blown away by it because it made so much sense to me. Mm. Yeah, man, thank you for that. Th this is a this is an example of what we were just saying, where our traditions can yep. make the Word of God of no effect. Yep. So many churches get to the place where, yeah, you, you can't come in the pulpit unless you've got a Ph.D. or an MDiv, unless you've been to uh, even particular kinds of schools, right? right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and not others, you know what I mean? Yep. Um, and so those are human traditions. Those are not things commanded by the Scripture. And where we hold on to those things too tightly, um, then we could be looking in the face of men who are very godly, who are very gifted preachers of God's Word, who have pure motives, and be saying to them, you can't serve here. You, can't, you actually can't preach the Gospel because you haven't been to seminary. See, that's the, that's the tradition making the Word of God of no effect. Now, having said that, as you were just saying, we, we don't throw the seminary out. You know, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. What we have to recognize is that seminaries are relatively new 
in Christian history, mm. and they are parachurch organizations. They're not meant to replace the church, but they come alongside the church wow. to help the church do what it's meant to do. Wow. Um, and so when you say, how was a guy trained for ministry before the 1700s? Well, generally, he was going to the 1800s. Generally, he was going to be trained by the local church. Wow. And even when seminaries got their start, you know, you think of the Harvards, the Princetons. These were schools that were founded to train pastors for the church. They saw themselves as servants to the church, mm. which means that the main responsibility belongs to the to the preacher. Where, where we get that from? Well, we get that from Second Timothy two two, don't we? Where Paul says to Timothy, find faithful men basically whom you can trust to teach the Word, train them that they may be able to teach others also. And and Paul there is just, is just telling us, really, at the heart of the Christian ministry is this relay race. He, the apostle, gave the teaching to Timothy. Timothy is to find faithful men, train them with the teaching. They, in turn, are to find other people whom they teach. Well, all that's happening in the local church. That's not happening in the seminary. Um, Jesus never went to seminary. None of the apostles went to seminary. None of the early church leaders went to seminary. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm convinced that it's the local church that trains pastors. Uh, and, and I'm convinced that there are many men who have, you know, letters all the way up and down their sleeve, PhDs, MDs, THMs, so on and so mm-hmm. forth, who, who, who have done well academically, but don't know the first thing about how to lead a church. Wow. And so they graduate from seminary, and they go to churches, and they blow up their churches, because they, they've never led one. They've never really been in one. They've never really sat at the foot of, of, a, of a seasoned pastor and learn how to love people and lead people. Uh, and this is something that the African-American church, honestly, has, has done, in many cases, done very well throughout its history. So we have a tradition of sitting under pastors for a season. We have a tradition of being ministers and associates um, to pastors and, and learning how to carry his bag, you know, as a way of learning how to lead people. And so what I'm arguing in that chapter is, let's get back to making the local church central Sure. to training pastors and using, um, you know, internship programs, using residency programs, um, and using seminaries with guys for whom that's appropriate, uh, but not but not having a one-size-fits-all mentality, um, but, but just recognizing that our whole task is to, is to train people for the work of the ministry. Um, and if we're not doing that, then we're really off base. Good. Um, why is it so hard for us to remove ungodly leaders? Yeah, that's tough, man. You know, there, there are a couple <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah, there, there are a couple things. I mean, one of, the, one of the hardest things you will ever do in a local church is remove someone from ministry. Sure. Uh, and yet, and yet, most churches at some point in their lifetime will will come to a situation where they have to do that, either because a pastor has fallen morally and disqualified themselves. Um, or because there's some other leader, a deacon or something, who uh, has developed a territorial mentality mm. and uh, is really divisive in some way. I'm in this office for letter. life. <laughs> hey, man, yeah, that's exactly right. This, this is my kingdom, you know what I mean? You know, think there's a whole letter in the New Testament on this. It's 3 John. Yeah. You know where John writes to the church and says, listen, you know, Diotrephes has set himself up as king. He's not even letting our letters be read to the people. Um, he's just writing things. And, and John says, you know, I'm going to have to deal with him when I come. Well, we, we have to deal with these situations in our local churches, and it's hard for a number of reasons. Number one, Oftentimes it's hard because we haven't done what we need to do on the front end to test a person's character and qualifications before putting them into office. Yep. Number two, and so therefore we don't have like First Timothy 3 and Titus 1 yeah. as the measuring stick for their job performance and so, their life. So some of these people shouldn't even have gotten the office to begin with. That's exactly right. And and the best, the best cure is prevention in that way, right? Mm. The, the other thing is, uh, you know, we 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 look for the wrong things um, when looking for leaders. We look for the businessman. We look for the popular man. We look for the person who's really, you know, influential in some worldly way, and we think that means he's going to be effective in the church. Well, actually, then you just wind up with worldly people leading the church, uh, and usually without a job description and without 
any clear rules for for removing them. And so churches, number three, are really wise then to to think through in their bylaws and constitution or to think through in their policies and procedures, what do we do and how do we do it biblically when it comes to having to remove someone uh, for any number of reasons? And so without that guidance, churches just flounder. And here's, here's the last thing I would say. I think it's hard to remove people because oftentimes we have um, a bad understanding of grace and love. So we think grace and love means let's just overlook it or let's just forget it or let's just move on. But First Corinthians 13 tells us love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, for example. Um, open rebuke is better than secret love, the Scriptures tell us. And so we have to understand that, that love for Christ love for his church, and love for the poor leader actually involves us uh, lovingly stating the truth and taking action to correct the situation um, where we need to do that. And so if we would understand love that way, if we would have procedures that are biblical, that would guide us, and if we would be careful to emphasize what the Bible emphasizes in terms of qualifications, it would all still be hard but we would be helped to know what to do, and we would have the confidence of the Scripture as we do it. Wow. Um, I have a, a question for you around millennials. Um, uh-huh. you, you wrote an article a couple years ago um, on the front porch just mm-hmm. around black millennials and the black church and um, you know, looking at some of the statistics and stuff like that. And obviously it was a couple years ago. So I don't I don't know if you if you still feel the same way about it. But one of the things that I've been experiencing with a lot of my friends, particularly that are in denominational black churches, um, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, you know, Baptist, Kojic, AME, those types of places is that there is a generation gap that's existing between like the baby boomers and then generation X slash generation Y. Um, millennials and particularly for a lot of these churches where baby boomers are in leadership position um, there's a a weird kind of dichotomy going on um, just in terms Mm -hmm. of um, you know uh, just how the church is ran um, you know how ministry is done uh, evangelism you know all those types of things and and I just think right now it just it seems from these conversations I'm having with people that it's, it's hard to um, it's hard for a lot of these churches to move forward because there's, there's just a, I guess just difference of opinion. Um, and, and I guess my question for you is just as a pastor who's you've planted, uh, you've been at established churches, you've been in different contexts is how do churches navigate that generational situation? Because this, you know this 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 happens every twenty years or so, where mm-hmm. you're you're going yep. <laughs> to just naturally have it. Um, and how do you you know how, how how what's a good way to navigate that? Yeah, that's a great question, brother. Uh, actually, it's it's the generational divide that concerns me perhaps more than any other divide in the African American church. Um, and you know we see it every day in our neighborhood, man. If you if you're under forty, yeah. you're under thirty five or forty uh, in Southeast DC. You, you effectively don't have much of a relationship at all with the church. Yeah. You, you haven't been brought up in church. You don't think to go to church. Um, you probably have some hard negative thoughts about the church when you do think about it. Uh, if you're over 40, then you're in that generation where you were made to go to church. Even mm-hmm. if mommy and daddy didn't go, they dropped you off at church. Yeah. And, um, and, and so you, you have this kind of church experience. And that's about the dividing line between the hip-hop generation and the civil rights generation. Yeah. And and the African American church with the with the rise of hip hop, you you would know this better than I would, took this very hard arm's length, almost that's the devil's music, yep. you know, kind of yep. stance. They missed it with hip hop. And that man. was Yeah. And that and in doing that, they took that hard stance against the heart song of our young people. Yep. Right? So so the soundtrack for for life, if you're under forty, it's hip hop, yep. you know, yep. uh, or, or or it's it's at least hip hop influenced, right? Yep. And um, so what has happened is we we've, we've got this situation where African American churches now feel divided along generational lines, and then when you add to that 
so many churches moving out to the suburbs for mm. bigger buildings and land and so on, then you also have entire communities in cities that are disconnected from the church, both mm. geographically and generationally. And that's that's real troubling, because it means, brother, that that the future is not in the church. Right. <laughs> it's in the street. Right. Or, or the future of the church, uh, when I look at a lot of, you know, young African-American men, and I'm, I'm not mad at them, I, I understand it, a lot of what should concern us is a lot of very gifted guys find their way into churches outside the African-American community, whether that's for theological reasons, whether that's for social reasons, yeah. wh- whatever it is. Yeah. And so there's this big, massive disconnect that I think should concern us when we think about the future of the church. Because I, I go into churches in in, um, in in my neighborhood, man, visiting sometimes, and, and most of the churches are small in number. And and they're older, they're fifties and sixties, and yeah. uh, a lot of the license plates are not DC license plates, but Virginia and Maryland license plates. So these are people who probably grew up in the community, moved and out moved to the out. suburbs. Yep. That's right, but yep. they drive back for church on Sunday, yep. and that church doesn't have a living connection with that community anymore, yep. um, and or has to work against itself to have one. So that's a huge concern. The question is, well, how do we navigate that? Well, one thing I think, brother is to really recover the Bible's metaphor for the local church. Mm. It, it's, not a, it's not a club. It's not a social organization. It's God's household. Yep. It's a family. And every family, if it's, if, it's, if it's survived for any length of time, every family is multi-generational. That the very family notion means you have to include within it grandma and grandpa, and you have to include within it grandson and granddaughter wow. and, and, and the parents in the middle. So because we don't think of our churches as families in as, in as strong a way as we ought to sometimes, then it's easy for us to just kind of regard the young people as young people and to sort of toss them away with that label. You know, there, there's some older people who can say young people and almost spit the word out, you know what <laughs> I mean? And throw people away because they're young. <laughs> Or vice versa. We can, we can be young people and we can be looking at the older people and, and wanting to participate yep. but unable to sort of plug in. Yep. And we can say all these old heads, yep. right? And then that becomes a negative pejorative. Yeah. Yeah. But if we're family, we don't talk about each other that way. Yeah, and we don't throw each other away. And we take interest in what, in what the other has interest in. And so my daughters listen to music. They have a wide sort of musical palette, man. And they listen to stuff. I'd be like, man, if it was up to me, I'd never listen to it. What is this, man? Skrillex. What is this, man? You know, but because, but because they're interested, I'm interested. That's good. At least enough to know them well. That's good. And to love them well. That's good. And if we would take that approach in, in our churches, I think it would go a long way in binding together the generations and restoring part of the, the, the sort of breach that's happened. The other thing I would say is that interest in young people, um, it, it can't just be paternalistic. You know, it can't just be, we, we love our young people, which I think our churches do. And we want to see our young people involved in church, which I, I think our churches do. It has to also be, we want to see them involved to such an extent that they own this with us. Mm. And, and we give we give them places and spaces for leadership. Yeah, but see, they, they, that's, uh, to me, that is one of the biggest things that I'm seeing is that um, in a lot of churches, I'm thankful my, my church is not in this space. But a lot of churches I see, unless you are related to your pastor's family or you're in the pastor's family or something like that, um, they don't put you in leadership positions. You don't get those opportunities. You don't, you know, I mean, I'm I'm in my mid-30s and I'm a deacon at a large Baptist church in Newark, New Jersey, and none of the other churches in the city um have members on their deacons ministry in that age range. And I'm not the only one. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of others in our mid thirties, a couple of other guys uh in their forties, you know, early forties. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. late thirties, early forties. And you just you just you just don't see that unless you're, you know, family member, you know, to the pastor or something like that. So 
Um, yep. No, that's that's huge, man. Because if if you if you have come to think that mid thirties and mid forties is too young yeah. to be in leadership, then then you you just you're too old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you think a man in his thirties yeah. with a wife and children who is qualified biblically is is too young, then I want to read to you that passage of scripture where Paul says to Timothy, First Timothy four, do not let anybody look down on you because you're young. Amen. But set the believers an example, Amen. you know, in terms of speech and conduct and so on. Um, so, so there's there's ageism that works both ways that has to be addressed. And and when we are a family, then we have a, a warm family context in which to lovingly correct that ageism uh, and to repair the intergenerational uh, nature of the church. Um, and and you know, it, the, the, the sort of involving the young people in leadership, you know. Um, that's got to be more than say Youth Sunday, mm. and it's got to and it's got to be more. <laughs> and that's Fifth Sunday. Yeah. We don't even get that every month. That's Fifth Sunday. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and, and it's got to be more than segregating folks off into children's church or yeah. youth church. Yeah. You know, in many churches, man, and and again, this is not just African American churches. It's more so the case with other churches than African American churches, I think. But in many in many churches, you can go from birth to 18 years old and be raised in the church and never have been in a service yeah. with, with the adults of the church. Yeah. And so then you go off to college and you don't know what adult Christianity looks like. Right. And, and, and this is what the statistics you began this with, you know, stop talking about the millennials dropping out when they go to college. Well, they would, they had never dropped in. Mm. They, were never, they were never a part of a church oh, as is good. biblically defined. That's They'd good. always been in specialized youth programs. Um, and so then you go to college and you don't need that specialized youth program. And when you got frats and sororities and classes and, you know, athletic events and you put your life into a whole other context, if you're not really disciple and involved in the life of the church. And so we've got to find ways of bringing young people into the center of uh, our, our community experience as, as the family of God. Um, so that it's, it's, the church is in their bones, and they love it, and they're a part of it, just the way they are part of their families and love their family. Man, Tabidi, man, I could I could talk to you every week on the show about these issues. Man. <laughs> that would be a joy for me. Your listeners might not appreciate it, but I would love it. <laughs> we, could, we could talk about this every week, man. Um, mm. Like seriously, man, I, I, I like your, your insight on these issues. Um, it, it means so much to me, man, because. Um, you know, I'm I'm talking to so many people and just just seeing the culture, and you know, I'm seeing uh, people calling themselves that are that are that believe they're genuine believers, but they don't want to go to church uh, because of these issues. You know, we're talking millennials, Gen Xers, Gen Yers that like you know, it, it, it's like and, and and these are these are huge uh, issues and stumbling blocks. And one of the things that the Lord showed me um, is that. When we have all these millennials not in church, let's say they do come back when they're 40, you know, because that happens in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. There's some statistics that say people come back when they're 40. Man, they're 40, but they're a babe in Christ at that point. Yes. So yes. you're a grown man <laughs> yes. or a grown woman with a family. Yes. And at mm-hmm. 40, you should definitely be serving in ministry, <laughs> yeah. leadership, these types of things. But because. You're a babe in Christ. You know, it's like, what do you what do you do with that person? Mm-hmm. Because they're yep. 40. You're like, man, it's like I'm discipling them. Like, how you know, yep. how's, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that I think that's spot on, man, because, you know, sometimes, man, if, if, if a local church doesn't have a real culture of disciple making and discipleship, then what can happen is the people in there who who look to be spiritually giants, spiritual giants in that church, you pluck them out and put them in a church where people where there is a culture of discipleship, and you find out just as you're saying, they're infants and babes. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, man. That one of the things we we talk about in in the book is the is the necessity of of discipling people, yep. um, and and being very intentional about that and recognizing that you know the Sunday school hour don't get it. You know, it's got to be it's got to be life on life through the week that we pour into each other's lives and help each other grow uh, in the things of the Lord. And um, you're right, you you check out 
in college or you're sort of, uh, if you're millennial and so on, you check out in college, you've gone for 20 years, you show back up, and normally you show up with, with some kids and maybe yeah. a wife. Yep. Uh, you show, you show up with yep. some problems. Family. Yep. Um, yeah, and, and when you should be in the years of your full flower, when you should be in the years of, of peak productivity, um, you're actually way behind the curve. Um, now that's, that's not reason to be discouraged or to quit. It's reason for us to, to make disciples. Um, but it is a, it is something that we need to recognize as, as a, as a byproduct of this generational division that you're talking about. Man. Powerful, powerful. Um, you know, I, I, I can't get you out of here without, I gotta at least give you one Christian rap question. Um, <laughs> I gotta give you, let me give you at least one. Um, um, man, I, who, who, who are you listening to these days, man? There's been a lot of, lot of good music I felt like come out, um, this year, man. And I know you, you kind of keep a pulse on the culture, man. So I'm just curious, um, you know, what's, what's, what's in your deck right now, man? Well, I'm, I'm interested in this Alex Faith joint that's about to drop. Mm. I just saw some, some folks tweeting that out. That's That's got me interested, yeah. sort of looking forward. So looking forward to, to sort of checking that out. But, man, I've, I've been having on Rewind of late, man, Eshawn Burgundy's piece of Fear of God, man, just really enjoying that. Um, I think that's and, the best uh, album of this year, personally. You think so? Yes. Man, it, and that's it, no, it, slight no slight to nobody. There's no slight to nobody. Because when I say yeah. these things, people will be, oh, what about... Listen, man, That to me, that album has stood up since it dropped earlier this year, man. Yeah, that, that joint's dope, man. Yeah. <laughs> I've, been, I've been enjoying that. And, man, you know, I, I tweeted out like crazy when it dropped, but I, I've gone back, too, to... Um, uh, Jackie Jackie Hill Perry's yeah. piece, man. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm still I'm still digging on that for a freshman album, man. For yep. a first album, yep. Uh, man, yep. man, just beastly. And she just um, started rapping. So, it's not like she was rapping ten uh, years yeah. and dropped. This, you know, what I mean? she just started. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 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 what I'm that's what I'm spending the day, man. Listening to the day and. Uh, but 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 you know I, just again man I think Christian hip hop Christian rap that's the hymnody of this generation man and uh, I I I firmly believe that if if we're seeing any revival in in um, in, in African American circles and and churches and I think we are then then one major contribution to that is is Christian hip hop man so much truth um, so much so much solid stuff. Uh, flowing through uh, the best of the of the artists, man, and, and the folks who take seriously not only the craft but the content of the craft, what they're actually saying um, in a in a biblical way, man. That that's blessing God's people. I know it's blessing. I know it's blessing this 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 brother. So. Yeah, yeah, same here, man. Uh, his book is called Reviving the Black Church. Uh, Pastor Tabidi, man, again, it's always a pleasure, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, man. Uh, Lado, man, good to be with you, man. Thank you. Thank you for what you do, man. Keep putting it down. Absolutely, man. On the way to radio show. On the way to radio. On the way to radio show. Where's much more music? It's ministry.